Hello, this is Fernando Gomez Sancha. Uh, this uh, video was uh, recorded last week, and uh, for some reason the audio was not uh, recorded in the operating rooms. But I decided to work on the video a little bit because it was a nice case showing very interesting and valuable information for those of you who are learning to do HOLIP. So this, uh, I don't remember exactly the characteristics of the case, but it's a mid-sized uh, prostate and with an elevated bladder neck and we were going to do a um, an unblocked section as always but the case was particularly uh, favorable in terms of uh, good visibility and I think it has a high didactic, didactic value. You see that the guy has um, some stones forming in the submucosally. That's the introduction of the fiber and that's the contour of the sphincter. You can see how the sphincter is clearly visible. That's the 12 o'clock limit and sometimes if you do this maneuver from Veru and then tilt up it shows you the the good place but not in every case uh, so I would rather um, trust what I see in terms of the contour of the sphincter and uh, I like to mark at 12 o'clock initially and then try to bring the incision downwards uh, more or less following the, the contour and the limits of the sphincter. I don't recommend to go very much inside because the plane is what it is and it reaches the sphincter and if you mark inside it's going to um, it's going to cause problems later so I think it's nice to mark exactly where the sphincter ends or one or two millimeters inside but not more than that because otherwise you will have a mark and maybe the mucosa will break uh, where the plane truly is so I think there's no risk in being anatomical in this respect when the visibility is good like in this case I think it's a good idea to deepen the white line deepen it a little bit because it will help you a lot to have a nicely established groove separating the tip of the noma from the sphincter. It's nice to cut these fibers that uh, join the sphincter to the adenoma because that will give you a very good protection of the sphincter and its mucosa. This, when we have worse visibility, we do this later on in the procedure. But of course, uh, having such good visibilities is wonderful. And that's the final cut on the mucosa over the veromontanum, cranial to the veromontanum, that will complete the white line. That's a small push with the tip of the scope. You know, I use the Richard Wolf instruments and they have a special tip, which is uh, metallic and blunt, and it's especially good for this mechanical dissection. And, uh, but I don't push very hard has to be a gentle maneuver and um, never push in urology and never push hard never use force as a, as a good advice for for urological procedures uh, endo urological uh, of course so that's the that's the posterior plane that's the separation between capsule and adenoma and then I position the fiber at 12 o'clock, as I always do. I like to keep it static at 12 o'clock and not rotate the camera because I think rotating the camera adds complexity to the procedure, whereas you can perfectly dissect the plane with the fiber at 12 o'clock. And as you can see, the screen is divided in two. You can see anteriorly the adenoma, posteriorly the capsule, in the middle of the screen the line of attack. The fiber is protruding a little bit, uh, just one third of the diameter of the scope more or less 
to provide this very nice setup for dissection of the posterior plane. We are going to, to di dissect a sphere. So initially the planes open. It opens to the sides, opens up, opens down, and then you have to close these planes. And that's very important because you have to choose where you're going to fire. So initially we're going to fire towards the line of attack. And then when we need to close the plane, we'll have to uh, fire more against the adenoma. So initially, firing against the line of attack will open the plane. This is the posterior plane. You see, you don't want to fire against the capsule. You just want to fire. And there you can see that the posterior apex has been already uh, dissected off the, off the capsule. Well, that's the, the line. Sometimes, of course, you don't want to leave adenomatous tissue there, so you have to you know, get your bearings right, you have to get your references right. That's why sometimes I go a little bit inside to check. But again, initially I like to cut on the adenoma. Here I'm not looking for the plane, I'm looking for dissecting the apex of the sphincter. Mm, it's very important. And then we will go and look for the right right plane. Let's see if we can find the right plane. That's a little bit mechanical push, but very, very gentle. But it's not opening easily, so I will use more energy and see. You know, when you go a little bit towards the cranial aspect, uh, you can see how things get clarified a little bit. So now that's another cut. That probably is the plane or it's very near. There is an apical adenomatous nodule anteriorly so we want to take it out so here you see you have to go and take it out even when it's close to the sphincter that's the 12 o'clock region and that is the ascending dissection from one side we're going to meet with the other side at 12 o'clock you see while you do this dissection Maybe there is some adenomatous tissue there. Let's see what happens uh, throughout the operation. You have to try to get as close as possible to the capsule. Like that. It looks pretty good. And you see what happens is that uh, when you put the scope on the side of the prostate and then you manage to climb up, the nose of the tip of the adenoma, the tip of the adenoma is going to come down because the scope is going to push it down. and then. The 12 o'clock fibers are going to verticalize. So that's the same maneuver. Initially, I don't mind cutting on the prostate. I'm not going to, let's say, lose the, the good plane. Well, that's actually the good plane. Huh? But initially, the intention is to separate the apex from the sphincter. And then we will go and look for the good plane very carefully because it, what, I, what, I, what I don't want to do is to rip the the sphincter or of course we have protected the mucosa already you see that's uh, getting towards 12 o'clock it's important to cut the most superficial the most uh, distal let's say attachments first and then move on to cut the more and more uh, proximal uh, but you don't want to dissect uh, too deep, for example, in this region, the lateral region, without cutting the distal attachments anteriorly. That's why uh, here we're following a reasonable plane, reasonable line. This plane is not very beautiful, but uh, it will serve as an example that sometimes the, the plane is not what we are used to see in the carefully edited videos and highly selected uh, videos where the plane is very beautiful. Uh, sometimes you have to to see these planes and you have to be careful and uh, you have to know that this is not that you're doing something wrong but uh, that the plane is not perfect like in selected videos. Huh? You see the energy from Holmium tends to the, the, the blasts that happen in the tip of a fiber tend to open the plane in the path of uh, least resistance and I think it, it's a very good 
way to, to, to look for the right plane. You know, if you fire your fiber against the line of attack, then you're going to find that um, the plane will open where it should most of the times. So here we're following the ascending dissection on the left side, trying to keep in contact with the capsule, trying to keep anterior, 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 because now we have passed the sphincter and here we are communicating both planes, both planes. There we are. So that's the dissection of the anterior plane. You see that uh, the fiber is firing against the line of attack initially, and that's the sphincter, properly preserved, and this is the apex, uh, totally dissected, totally free. You can go around it, and now the operation turns very easy. This is where I think beginners should start. You know, when you are learning the procedure, someone should release the apex and then you can do the circumferential dissection to get used to the fiber and the instruments and everything. And uh, the only trick here really is to, to continuously judge how is the plane looking. If you go a little bit deep, you have to correct, start correcting because we're now probably at the equator of the dissection and as I showed you before now the angles are going to start closing so we're going to need to progressively get the fiber to fire progressively closer to the adenoma and when you fire close to the adenoma what you achieve is to disrupt the fibers that are joining the adenoma to the capsule but not penetrating in the capsule so that's why if you choose to fire against the capsule, you might perforate, and that's a common common mistake for beginners. And uh, if you choose to fire against the line of attack, you might perforate because the angle of the capsule now it's it's closing, huh? yeah. so you are almost perpendicular to the to the capsule in, in in certain areas, which means that you have to keep the energy very very close to the adenoma. So it disrupts the fibers that unite the adenoma or join the adenoma to the capsule and uh, protect the capsule, avoid perforating it. So it's a very, very simple concept. And of course, you need to see procedures. And that's why I'm posting these videos to try to equip you with the best information before you, you start uh, your own experience with uh, Holmium. And uh, also, I think, if you're going to use some other form of energy, it's going to be useful information. So there it comes. You see now the angles are closing. The fiber progressively will get closer and closer to the adenoma to avoid perforating the capsule. Mm -hmm. The circumferential dissection. The second important thing is to keep the dissection uniformly uh, advancing towards the bladder neck so circumferentially now uh, you don't want to develop posteriorly a lot and then not anteriorly or one side and not the other side you want to go around the adenoma several times to make sure that the depth of the dissection is more or less the same otherwise it can get a little bit more difficult to have a, an asymmetric dissection uh, you want to make it symmetric here as you can see now when we go to the anterior we have to point towards the midline and uh, towards the center of the bladder neck. You see the angle is changing, so you have to take that into account. You cannot continue firing, uh, let's say, against the line of attack. You have to fire closer to the adenoma. Here, the scope is tilting a little bit. The, it's pushing down the adenoma, so we can, you see, get down, get down in the dissection get down towards the bladder neck. That's a very nice plane, very good looking, not so much bleeding. And progressively and slowly and carefully, you see, you leave the energy to do the job. These uh, little explosions on the tip will find the right plane for you. Uh, but of course, you have to 
be in command of, of the dissection and judge if you have to go a little bit deeper or if you have to go a little bit more superficial. There what I'm looking for is the vertical fibers of the mucosa of the bladder neck. And you see that we can see circular fibers above the fiber and now we are starting to see more vertical fibers. Uh, and think... when, when we can clearly see the vertical fibers, that's in an inequivocal sign that that is the entrance to the bladder. So slowly in that direction, looking down a little bit, you see that's the entry to the bladder. It's important to cut the whole depth of the bladder neck. It's also nice to have a good hemostasis before opening this uh, plane because as you have seen the space that we have been dissecting is very small and the irrigation inside this, this space is very very efficient so when you open the bladder if there is bleeding uh, uh, the blood will enter the bladder and then maybe it's difficult to keep this uh, wonderful visibility so I think especially at the beginning, uh, before opening the bladder neck, when you find these fibers, before entering the bladder, try to do a good hemostasis of the fossa and then move on to the next uh, step. That's bladder neck, we're cutting it down. I had already seen that the uh, UOs were quite far, but I'm checking again, you see, to, to check where we are. We don't want to damage the UOs if, if it's possible. And um, the dissection continues. Huh? It's important to note that the capsule has a white appearance, you see, and uh, if you find the uh, adenomatous nodules, which are quite common in this uh, region, subcervical nodules, they're going to look a little bit more yellow. Huh? So you have to be vigilant for the details. That looks very capsular, very nice, despite the quality of the plane is not perfect. We found a lot of stones in these uh, cavities that I think it's a nice thing to be able to take them out. Probably if you did a TURP they wouldn't come out because you don't usually go that deep in, in your resection. And uh, as I said uh, we have to be vigilant to look for the quality of the tissue and especially because I think if you need that that's a little bit deep so we have to be careful you see the fiber has to get very close to the adenoma instead of firing against the line uh, that will give you the dissection of this uh, plane even when it's uh, perpendicular to the to the fiber uh, so keep close to the adenoma correct the position so if you dissect uh, a little bit more I don't know what happened there uh, if you dissect a little bit more you have to reposition the fiber so it gets close to the adenoma again. So this is how you advance in your dissection of the posterior plane. Also, of course, it's nice to have a nice connection with the bladder neck area. Huh? If you're going to do the posterior dissection, it's nice to have these angles, you know, from lateral, from, from, from the posterior plane and the lateral plane. I mean, dissect all this so you can see the bladder neck and because that's going to be an excellent reference to know how much more you need to dissect and how to understand the anatomy. Huh? So before dissecting the posterior plane, I think it's healthy to, to release these lateral attachments near the bladder neck and then the dissection of the posterior plane is going to be much safer. Many times we dissect the posterior plane from the lateral to the medial aspect, you know, following more or less this uh, this region. You see, this operation is quite relaxed and uh, it's very nice, it's very anatomical. So there is no tension, you know, in the operating room. We are just happily operating during the, the surgery. Uh, so and that's how it should be, I think. So. Of course, it's nice to have good instruments, it's nice to have a good camera system. Uh, if you want to do this seriously, you have to have good instruments and a good team helping you. And uh, people who know how to manipulate the morselator and how to help you change the instruments very fast. So here it's very common 
to you know fear to go under the bladder neck you know to 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 invade the retrotrigonal space and uh, so we have to be very careful and as i said keep the fiber close to the adenoma so it's not aggressive towards the the capsule you see the difference of color huh, between adenoma which is more yellow and the capsule which is more white and here we're going to see something that is very common and um, I guess many holep surgeons when they find a nodule like this they would cut through the nodule and continue more or less with the same plane but I am more prone to follow this uh, dissection of these nodules and I hope we can reach it soon so you can see I know there's a nodule because I've seen the video before and uh, I think it has some interesting, uh, let's say, information. Also, for the moment, that plane looks good. Uh, we're coming up, trying to connect the posterior with the lateral, as we did before, trying to reach the bladder neck to progressively approach this uh, posterior plane with uh, good references. You see here, the plane is dissecting very nicely. Uh, we are very capsular, but uh, that's normal. Huh? The capsule tends to be thinner in this in this region. And here, trying to dissect the posterior aspect, judging, you know, the quality of the fibers, the quality of the plane, the coherence of the line of dissection. But then I see that yellow tissue there. I think. This is something you start suspecting. You see, that's a little bit yellow when you fire on it. So it looks more like a noma, huh? you see? So the probably is a nodule down there. So I'm going back a little bit, trying to check and trying to lift this up. I'm not afraid of going, let's say, towards the capsule, deepening the dissection because I'm very, very careful, you see? If you start seeing something that you don't like, you can always stop. And many times you have to do this exploration if you want to, let's say, to find out. Uh, but that yellow stuff looks like adenoma, so I want to take it out. Um, so very, very carefully and very progressively, you see, trying to lift it from the capsule. Of course, these uh, nodules are going to compress the capsule, are going to make the capsule very thin. Uh, when we see this on an MRI, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, you, um, you can see that these nodules grow inside the peripheral zone. But there's always, always some, let's say, compressed capsule or thinned capsule around them. So you can safely dissect them as long as you are careful and you know trying to achieve a complete clearance of the adenomatous tissue mm -hmm. you have to constantly judge where's the plane what is the good plane you see because you don't want to leave a nodule of bph tissue that will grow over time after the operation the fossa looks very big but uh, it tends to collapse with time. After six months, patients with you know huge glands, 100 gram, gla uh, gram of prostates, or uh, sorry, uh, more than 100 grams, uh, they, they, they get a very, very small prostate, which is maybe 15, 20 cc's. So a nodule that looks irrelevant in a big fossa like this might become obstructive after some time. So. You don't want to leave the nodules if you can help it. I have to say it makes the operation much more interesting. And of course you see the round uh, quality of this nodule growing inside the capsule, right? You see it's diff separated from the adenoma. It's a separated entity and there we are. So you can see the thin capsule behind it, uh, but so you have to judge I mean, how much uh, risk you want to take. Some other people tend to vaporize these nodules, you know, instead of taking them out, 
they use the, the holmium energy to, to vaporize the nodule. But I think if you can do a safe, careful dissection, uh, it's probably nicer than coagulating. And also, you're, it's more difficult to ascertain the depth of the nodule and to know if you left uh, some tissue behind or not. So here, I'm constantly using the same principle. Get close to the nodule, fire close to the nodule, you see, so separate it from the capsule, but not uh, penetrate into the capsule. You see, slowly, slowly negotiating this until it can be uh, enucleated with the adenoma. That's the bladder neck, that's the posterior plane. See, there's very little attachment now, here again, close to the adenoma, close to the adenoma to protect the plane. Here there is, uh, you know, some danger. Where am I pointing? Where I am pointing because uh, that's a retro trigon. That's a it, if you push uh, there, or if you do a little bit of force, sometimes uh, you can you can open it up, and of course it's irrelevant, but uh, it doesn't look very good. Now here I am pushing one of the lobes into the bladder, and now the other lobe. You see, it's uh, I'm trying to do a rotation of the adenoma to negotiate it, the passage. That's the nodule. You see, it left. Uh, that's a small artery. It left. Um, it left a footprint, huh? and this is an MRI where you can see how these nodules grow inside the peripheral zone. So it's perfectly possible to take them out and to avoid uh, further growth. And that's the end of the procedure. You see that uh, capsule down there is a little bit thin. After all, these operations are not very long. Uh, you, you, you see that the video takes uh, half an hour for a relatively bulky adenoma. So it's it's not, uh, there is a risk of extravasation of water, but it's, uh, it's uh, let's say, small risk. I would say also that uh, if you find that the capsule is very thin and there could be extravasation of water, you can take some precautions like lowering the irrigation fluid, never close the outflow, you know, to cause that distension and a tendency to, to extravasate. I use a continuous flow cystoscope and I never touch the inflow and outflow, you know. Uh, you want to simplify uh, things and uh, some people are always touching this and I think it's, it's a mistake. So keep the continuous flow flowing. You can regulate the pressure at which you work by elevating or descending the irrigation uh, height, uh, the, the fluid, the bag height will give you more or less pressure. There it is. So that's the conclusion of the enucleation. You can see there's a very nice fossa. And look at the quality of the mucosa. You see, if you see the image on the right is what you want. The image on the left is what you don't want. And this is what you got with the classic three-lobe technique and de-epithelialized sphincter, which I think was the explanation for the uh, initial uh, incidence of a stress incontinence, temporary stress incontinence, but that could last uh, several weeks. And I think one of the possible mechanisms was the damage of the mucosa of the sphincter. Uh, you want to protect it. And uh, now this is going to be the morselation. We're changing the instrument, the cystoscope for an nephroscope. My nurses are very well trained in uh, how to do this, and uh, we can do it very fast. So, in the meantime, I keep the irrigation flowing, but then, of course, we have to change the instruments. I hold the external sheath while my nurse takes out the rest of the instrument to do a fast change, so we don't decompress the bladder too much. That's the UO, that's the fossa, and that's the morselator. Uh, this is the position for working, I'm lowering my hands to elevate the tip uh, into the middle of the bladder, and I like to keep the, uh, the morselator blade a little bit inside, so I can see the adenoma anteriorly and two black triangles 
at the sides of the blade. That Those black triangles mean that I'm not close to the bladder. Uh, if they start turning pink, that means that the bladder is coming closer to me or that I'm lowering the tip and that could mean that there is some risk. I had to say this, uh, Richard Wolff uh, Morselator, the Piranha system is amazing because it really removes the anoma very fast. We, we measured 11 grams per minute of uh, and uh, it really shortens the procedure. You know, many times when you distend the bladder, the distension is going to be causing some, some bladder bleeding. And uh, of course, we're not irrigating the bladder in a continuous flow fashion, so visibility tends to drop. But if you can morselate this fast, this is really amazing. And that's the end of the operation. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, don't hesitate and nucleate. Huh? All the best to all of you.